Good afternoon, UK. Uh, good evening, India. I hope you're having a great conference. I'm Lawrence Oaksash, CEO of City Science. Uh, we're a UK-based software development data and modeling company. Uh, and, and I'd invite you to visit our booth to see more about what we do. It's great to be with you to chair this event focused on new thinking, new models, new insights. Obviously, a subject close to my heart and the hearts of our speakers. And we've got some fantastic speakers today. Uh, Ravav Vignair from WSP, uh, Sridivi Kotayil from ACOM, Prashant Udayakuma from Steer, uh, Shubanka Tiwari from Sunovatec. And we're also expecting Abdul Pinjari, an Associate Professor of Transport at the Institute of Science in Bangalore. So each speaker will have 12 minutes to give you their take on how new models and new thinking can deliver the insights relevant to local and national schemes. I encourage you throughout to ask questions in the chat. We'll consolidate those and pose them to our speakers in the roundtable discussion at the end. There is a dedicated Q&A tab on the right of the conference room, so please add your questions in there. That's the conference room Q&A, not the event Q&A. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, Rivafi Nair from WSP, who's going to be talking about enabling mobility in urban India. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, all, and thank you for joining this session. Uh, the, the discussion that I would like to lead today is enabling uh, mobility in urban India through better transport model. Before I dive into the topic, a bit about me and why my thoughts actually matter. So I work as principal engineer within WSP and I lead the strategic modeling team there. I have more than 10 years of experience uh, split between UK, Middle East and India. And my uh, area of expertise would be uh, working on strategic and micro simulation models. So I have just mentioned a few of the projects that I have been fortunate to be working with across the uh, different geographies. So moving on. Uh, let me just uh, come straight to the point and why should we worry about the current state of affairs of the Indian transport model and the modeling in general. So the government of India has uh, issued some policies which are going to uh, create some sort of responses which are very drastic in nature. And some of the some of these issues, the, the effect of these policies are anyways being felt by all of us as uh, urban Indian mobility consumers. So some of, the, uh, some of the issues which our transport modeling currently lacks are exactly these. So that's why it's quite important to address whether is, is it actually possible to model all these response within our current transport model. And the other thing that I worry about is if our transport models don't uh, capture all these trends, the change in climate, the change in accidents, I'm worried that the, the whole uh, stage is then left over to the startups to take care and then modify. And on the right hand side, I have mentioned a uh, few, uh, few trends which are upcoming, like shared mobility, micro mobility, preference of EVs. So as a response to the models not uh, giving the proper uh, responses, the urban consumers themselves have started adopting their lifestyle. So just moving on, let me uh, come to the point of what is the very first thing that as a transport modeler that when I was working on Indian project that I faced. So the very first thing that I faced was that most of the concept and the software are actually borrowed from uh, Anglo-American uh, context in the sense that most of these studies uh, have been uh, undertaken in a high income country and the software, the vendors are also uh, predominantly uh, from these high income countries and most of the uh, features which are provided in these software cater to their demands. So that was the first problem that I was facing while I was being a modeler for an Indian project. So one might argue Indeed, they had spent three decades of effort in perfecting this art and science of modeling. So why can't we just adopt the thing as it is? Like, why should we invest more time in coming up with something? And the answer to that uh, would be that Indian traffic is very complex. Now, this is a statement which might be overused uh, time and again in most of the literature. But I would like to uh, dwell a little more on what exactly is complex. So let me try to define complex in my own terms. So uh, what I meant by complex is that 
uh, I have provided uh, uh, before and after of how this urban population has grown. And this is not a very linear growth. It's a very uh, exponential growth, I can say. And if you see, the, there are a variety of modes which are available within the Indian context, which are not available elsewhere. So you have a very big share of two-wheeler, which most of the softwares, uh, when they first entered the Indian market, weren't even aware that most of the cities would be, uh, uh, we need to model the two-wheeler behavior in those cities. So uh, the transport modeling, which is currently taking place, is only in the small portion of roughly about 4, 450 million people who have about 3 million odd cars. That's what the transport modeling in general right now caters to. Whereas there is a very big gray area that we have not even talked about. And if I take the government, so there, there are three main key, uh, key players, the urban consumer, and then there are the automakers, and then there are there is the government. Even the government uh, has been spending 50%, almost close to 50% of their budget in terms of road. And the rest of the transport is not seeing the growth that competition. So just to simplify, to me, the complex would be uh, there is non-linearity and there is non-stationary. Every day there is a growth that is happening, which is not being captured in the models which we are adopting from the Anglo-American context. Okay? So moving forward. So what I have done is I'm, uh, I'm going to go across India, I'm going to pinpoint and take four cities which have been part of a, a urban renewal program or a retrofitting program called Smarts Mission. And I'm going to look at what these projects are and where the uh, modeling challenges are going to be. So the very first uh, place that I am going to land is in a, um, in a state of Tamil Nadu. So this state, uh, in general, all the cities have been uh, burdened with the number of road accidents, but uh, Tamil Nadu has come to the forefront and they have, uh, as a part of Smart Cities mission, they have come up with a number of initiatives uh, which has helped them contain the number of fatalities in the room. So it is really uh, a wonderful uh, and a brilliant attempt on the part of the state government to set up uh, in a, a database management system wherein we modelers can now start predicting the road fatalities. but. My worry is not about getting the data. So since we have already started the ball rolling on how to get the data, I'm going to go ahead and think more about how are we going to model this? How are we going to predict? How are we going to put this in the project evaluation? So for that, I'm going to borrow a concept called uh, road user, uh, so accident prevention cost. I'm going to borrow this concept because I've been working uh, with UK and in Middle East regions, uh, I'm going to borrow these concepts from them. And I would like to mention about a software called Koba LT, which is used in the UK to predict the accidents. And uh, quickly in a nutshell, what it does is it, it predicts the number of accidents per million vehicle kilometer. So uh, for every uh, vehicle kilometer change on the network, we can predict what is the change in the number of accidents. And the second most important point is they have associated a cost with respect to this uh, accident. And by, uh, uh, and by converting it to, into a monetary terms, they can now they put it into their project appraisal process. So this, this is called a prevention cost. And they have, uh, this is a very popular economic theory, which is willingness to pay, uh, pay approach. So this is what they have used to associate a cost to an accident. Now, let me come back to our Indian context on, can we blindly adopt this approach since they have done a lot of work, can we blindly adopt this approach? So, uh, so we have already deal with historical data and how government is setting up so many database centers to collect the accidents. Uh, the second cost is most of the models which we have in India are very simple economic models. So a simple cost benefit and uh, analysis would not be a perfect tool in our context. So let's take the case of UK. And UK, per capita income is about 31,000 pounds, and the cost of car is about 25,000 pounds. Apologies if they, these are not, these are very, uh, almost almost uh, very common figures. Uh, but what, what I would like to make the point here is the affordability of car and how it is accessible to everybody. Uh, but contrast that to the picture in India. In, in, in India, uh, average, uh, this is across everybody, urban, rural, put together, 
uh, our uh, average income median in, uh, median income is about 126968 and an average car is about 5 lakh and most of the people who are now on indian roads do not have anything called social security and they do not, they do not have anything called insurance so if we were to associate a cost similar to, to what they have done in hic country what is going to happen is uh we know the nature of uh, i have been following the morth which is uh, ministry of road transport uh, uh, and they have been uh, providing year on year accident statistics and i've been following it the number one cause of accidents is over speeding uh by two wheeler and car uh, and the victims are unfortunately pedestrians and the pedestrians are in indian context they are the lowest strata of the society so if a car hits a pedestrian it is it is quite likely that a high strata income is impacting a low strata income and if you were to do a project appraisal based on that what would happen is just the sheer increase in the travel time saving of the infrastructure project would easily nullify any any accident dis benefit cost which is absolutely incorrect it's not the method to do because uh, then we are not doing any the equity component is totally taken out of project appraisal so that's the point which i would like to make here and then there is a curious case of uh, when you do an accident benefit analysis you would see that how many deaths happen uh, and what is the proportion of death to a serious injury to a minor injury injury and most of the literature states that india's have a very high death to serious ratio but actually it's not true what happens is in a very resource poor country or uh, in a developing economy like india the most important thing uh, that people record is the death so the police is quite clear in that uh, the death statistics are reliable but most of the serious and minor injury injuries never get reported so uh, statistics if at all you were to use all these statistics which is an anglo american concept we have to make sure that underlying data statistically is correct so that's the point about modeling safety so let me move on i'm coming to another city which is to the east of india which is bhubaneswar now this city has been battling a uh, traffic jam um, nothing new to any other indian city but it has been uh, trying to get um, uh, in vogue with using uh, atcs which is adaptive traffic control system so what they have done is they have uh, there are a lot of popular softwares in place Uh, around the globe which is one is scoot and one is cats uh, scoot it's uh, very prevalent in uk cats is in australia but uh, this city has not gone for any of those it has got got uh, got for a system called uh, cozy coast now cozy coast is something which is developed in india so what they have done is uh, they have uh, what they claim is that the other uh, the cities uh, the other urban cities across the globe have a certain pattern of traffic which the scoot and scat can actually predict and then uh, it can uh, the performance evaluation can happen without any uh, issues but our indian traffic is not as per that so some of the features so when you are we are when you are going to uh, implement a cozy coast when you want to do a modeling aspect of cozy coast let's see what are the problems here so as i said uh, all the atcs has to be uh, evaluated using uh, any micro simulation software so the most in vogue micro simulation software uh, we have a lot of responsibility as a indian traffic modeler to make sure the traffic which is being modeled is a heterogeneous traffic there is uh, absolutely a lack of lane discipline when it comes to very congested 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 junctions so the turning counts cannot be estimated properly and uh, the concept of queue completely uh, disappears as long as uh, as as and when the congestion becomes more intense so all these atcs which are being uh, uh, which are uh, not uh, which are uh, the cozy coast and the new coming of age software that uh, which india is producing we are not having a particular platform to test it and we uh, the project budget uh, is not having enough cost to sustain the r and d required to uh, implement and evaluate it so that is the issue that we have been facing uh, and the performance evaluation also so there are a lot of uh, performance evaluation measures like throughput generation increase in uh, speed but in indian context there are only two things that we can actually effectively measure which is delay minimization 
and minimizing the number of stops. These are the two things that we can effectively use as a performance evaluation. And then there are a number of field conditions which, uh, which render any Bayesian study completely invalid. So one of the thing is that when you use a scoot, you use something called an upstream detection, but you have parking all over, all over the side streets, you have parking. And this, this entire concept of upstream detection uh, completely doesn't have a meaning. Ravapi, when it comes I'm just going to need to hurry you along a bit, if that's OK. Yeah, sh sure. So uh, I'll just move on quickly with respect to the BRT. So uh, with respect to BRT, one of the most complexity that we face is actually modeling the uh, generalized time in the BRT. So we have certain methods called stated preference, re revealed preference. But the uh, problem that we face is we do not have a skilled or what we have a lack of time because we only uh, it's a usually paper and pen based method. We go on site. So we do not have a skilled or qualified eliminator to actually conduct the stated preference survey. So uh, one of the thing that I was uh, hoping that we could discuss is what about all the surveys become web based. And the case four that I have in is a project called a bike sharing system, which is done in Bhopal. Now, uh, this is a very unique uh, project, but some of the pro problems that we deal here is that this is a very simplistic uh, demand assessment because we just don't have data. So what they have done is the area, uh, the, uh, the influence area of the bike zone is taken equal to the ward area, which is a very big, uh, very big, uh, geographically very big compared to the zone that they are talking about. And they have completely neglected the as aspect that a car and two-wheeler can uh, can do a mode shift to a bike. And the fact that the future projections are all in incremental, but everybody, uh, everybody who is in this field would know that the bicycle levels would be governed by the population, the current condition, etc. So just to summarize all the points, there are a lot of data issues that we have with us. We have bias in our data. We use an aggregated approach. We have no homogeneity in our link. And our forecast, uh, our long-term forecast uh, really do not account for any rapid urbanization. And we have no representation of active modes, wherein that is the largest number of modes that you can see. So the way forward that I would suggest is uh, for uh, government to initiate a large unbiased data collection drive. And uh, if, if uh, the speakers uh, prior to these session, uh, India sessions were mentioning about how costly it is to do a, uh, collect the data. So I was thinking that we can promote certain incentives like data credits to the uh, mobility consumer because it's a fact that all of us now have internet and smartphones. And one thing that is lacking is a common uh, repository of recent research on heterogeneous traffic. If this is maintained by the government, it would be very helpful for the consultants because we are battling very short time. Our transport projects do not uh, do not have any scope to bear the burden of uh, research. And unlike in the West, we there are no initiatives of tax credits whatsoever. The other thing that I would compare and contrast is that in the Western world, there is a concept of post-opening project evaluation. What happens to the project once it opens? And I would uh, recommend that such an initiative is carried by carried out by the Indian government. So, and uh, the result of these uh, uh, post-opening project evaluations are made to the general public, so they can be convinced of the modeling results. <coughs> and fourth and the final point that I would like to make is there is a lot of research happening within the uh, within what is required for the transport modeling and how to adapt uh, the uh, Western software, Western concept to an Indian concept. But unfortunately, we do not have much of commercial takers for these uh, solutions, which again proves a barrier in implementing it live on the job. So with that uh, thoughts, uh, thank you, Lawrence, for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Vivafi. Some great context there about the key drivers of change and the changing consumer preferences. And also really important to highlight the history of transport models that we're using. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Sridivi Kotiyil from ACOM, who's going to be talking about the evolution of transport modelling. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. 
Um, so I'm Sridevi Kotil. I work uh, in ACOM Global Design Center in Bangalore, and uh, I am primarily a, a strategic as well as a micro simulation modeler. And I work a lot on uh, the global context. Uh, I work mainly support, uh, do a lot of projects uh, in the UK and Ireland and Middle East regions. So I think this opportunity that Tom had uh, given me to voice out my opinion on uh, modeling international is a great opportunity uh, where I can talk about the new thinking and new evolution of models and give a little more insights and some of my thoughts um, including some examples that I've seen from India um, to uh, this platform so without uh, much uh, delay I'd like to uh, move to the uh, I would like to start talking about the evolution of uh, transport modeling industry so I am um, I'm pretty sure a lot of us who uh, are in the um, uh, transport modeling industry uh, know about a lot of changes that is coming forth uh, with uh, big data sources, uh, the AI techniques, uh, machine learning techniques, and things like that. So there's a lot of opportunity with all this evolution that is coming in, as well as there is a lot of challenges which comes by this. So um, I'd like to talk a bit about the opportunity that comes with uh, the evolution of uh, transport uh, modeling industry with these big data sources. So I think one of the points our uh, previous speaker uh, picked up on uh, was the availability of data uh, database and uh, the um, uh, importance of having a, a database which can be continuously collected and um, stored. So I guess uh, at the minute in India with a lot of technological advancements uh, and a lot of uh, cheaper technology that is coming up uh, with the startup evolution in India, which uh, some of us might be aware of, uh, this is a great opportunity to start thinking about having a continuous database and having these uh, database uh, stored in for the use of transport modeling as well as wider planning aspects. And uh, there's a lot of more modern based, um, modern age data based studies that are evolving, which are a slightly uh, a deviation or a slight a deviation to the conventional transport modeling studies that we do. So I guess uh, an example to that is one of the studies that I had done in the past in which uh, we had investigated uh, a driver route choice just with the use of uh, Bluetooth sensor data. And this was done for the uh, Derbyshire County Council in the UK. And we were successful in achieving uh, the answer to the question of uh, what is the purpose of uh, certain drivers taking shorter routes or uh, what is the rationale of taking an alternative route when there is a shorter route available. So I guess um, with all this uh, new age technologies and new age uh, techniques that are available for that matter, this is a great opportunity for us to for us modelers to start thinking about the changes that we would like to bring by into our industry. And I think one of the biggest examples that we would have to keep in mind is the evolution of Google Maps uh, from uh, from being a uh, navigation tool uh, for uh, drivers, it sort of has become handy for a lot of transport modelers and planners around the world uh, where uh, it is uh, sensible to use. So I guess um, you can see the change in the industry that is coming with it. Uh, so that the, with that question, I think uh, we have spoken a little bit about the opportunities. Now, what are the challenges that we think can come into the industry if we start uh, using these kind of uh, modern techniques? Of course, uh, the client mentality or our local authority, local authority or any other uh, users who are uh, probably going to use uh, would be imposing a, a sort of reluctance to the use of these new techniques. So I think we as uh, modelers should start gaining the knowledge and uh, understand it and impart this knowledge onto our clients and others in the traditional transport modeling industry. Because I'm uh, pretty sure that uh, a lot of software uh, related um, technicians would appreciate the use of this data and uh, help uh, in the solution of a lot of uh, transport modeling problems or transport uh, planning problems at much uh, faster pace um, in uh, contrast to the way we do our traditional conventional uh, 
modeling. So I guess uh, so with this challenges, uh, we also have the time and cost uh, challenge for the client. So I think that there is a bit of uh, doubt on how much time and cost uh, it would take for us to get into these techniques. So uh, with a lot of this, we have to start thinking of providing some solutions to this. And in terms of solutions, I mean to say that um, we need to start thinking about having a continuous dialogue between the industries and start uh, a kind of hand holding and um, marrying the different techniques and theories these, uh, that we have in order to give a better prediction towards our models. Now, this is a global uh, aspect as well as this can be taken um, into the Indian context, which uh, is going to be a little more relevant in the Indian context, I believe, which I'll get into in some of my uh, next examples. So uh, we have to start promoting these newly developed tools and techniques to our clients uh, through some fixed data sets. Say we have a fixed uh, data set um, testing tool for a development case or a congestion case or a roundabout scenario or a simple signal junction scenario. So we have a test case and we start using these ML AI techniques on these small test cases and start uh, educating our clients and even our fellow co-workers uh, as well as colleagues who are there in the industry to sort of slowly start looking into shifting our uh, methods of modeling and try to um, help in uh, providing a better optimal solution to the industry. So there's a lot of research and development opportunity in there. And uh, with that matter, we uh, are in a position with the pandemic that has come across. Uh, we are, uh, we modelers have started thinking about a lot of uncertainty prediction. Now, uh, why is it important at this stage? I think um, a lot of modelers might have, or in the academia, they might have thought about uh, the uncertainty predictions, but we as transport modelers or consultants like me, who work in purely consulting world, we have really uh, purely based it on our uh, traditional uh, model predictions uh, using growth uh, in terms of employment and other activities. So I guess with the pandemic, it has imposed a question of um, what is the need um, for transport planning to cover the new normal activities? And are the activities that we used to do in the past, is it the same set of activities that we are going to um, repeat? Have we, uh, should we start looking at new parameters to it? I think to answer that question, uh, it brings in a little more context when we think about agent-based models, because agent-based models, uh, a lot of research have been done, and in one of the previous um, um, firms that I have worked in, there was extensive research on agent-based modelings, and it sort of gave real-time solutions. And I think that sort of shift is also bringing in about the change in the transport modeling industry uh, that is coming with all this AI and MI, um, uh, ML techniques. So with this shift, it will also enable us to start predicting about the uh, patterns of users and the importance of users in the system than the user classes. So we modelers generally, even if we are going for a strategic model or a micro simulation model, we go by user class. We rarely go by i think very little in very little cases we might may have gone by users in the traditional consulting industry so the now it is highly a big uh, time for us to start thinking about the users prediction of users in the industry uh, sorry uh, in the um, transport modeling network so there is a lot of research that is going on uh, in the uh, academia in relation to all these theories and aspects. However, there we seem to see a lot of gap between the academia and the consulting world. I guess um, the the most important question is uh, why why do we have this sort of gap? Um, uh, w w is it something that is uh, coming down to the question of uh, the way our uh, curriculum that is set up? So in an Indian context, uh, I think we have a lot of theories and a lot of um, uh, knowledge base that we have including in, uh, included in our curriculum. But are we able to you know, come out into the industry and apply that as a real life case or a, as a potential practical solution? Are we able to apply that? So 
I think these are some of the things where we have to start thinking about bridging the gap between uh, the academic uh, industry as well as uh, the consulting world. So uh, in the past, when I did my uh, master's, I had um, done a, a sort of a prediction of um, generalized cost, VDMs use uh, on user base uh, with the use of uh, machine learning techniques. But when I stepped back into the industry after my uh, master's, I was not really able to apply it. So I think it's it, this is a good time for us modelers to start thinking about it with all this technological advancements that is happening in the industry as well as um, you know in, in in india now moving on to the indian context uh, so in india uh, i think before we start thinking about uh, all uh, moving on to the shift of um, uh, the uh, onto the shift of data boom or data science techniques we'd have to start thinking about the availability of models uh, a lot of um, insights uh, have been there. Uh, I have received a lot of insights from my other colleagues who work in uh, Indian industry saying that how difficult it is to model the heterogeneous traffic conditions using the standard industry software. So um, we modelers know a lot of uh, standard industry software and we use it uh, on, our, uh, on a daily basis or a day-to-day -day, uh, basis uh, in order to do a lot of predictions. But if we start thinking about modeling an Indian context where in a two -lane you would uh, in a two lane uh, carriageway you might end up seeing four to five vehicles and that two different kind of uh, vehicle types which are not standardized in any of the industry wide soft in a majority of the industry wide software so i guess the challenge there is on how to model these um, heterogeneous traffic conditions with all this mix of uh, vehicle types in india and um with that, uh, it is always good to think about some of the good practices from our other regions, uh, like uh, some of uh, us who have a lot of global uh, knowledge on the industry would be able to adopt some of the good practices from other regions and start trying to think and apply. Wait, and, I'm gonna you know, hurry you along now. Yeah. Uh, so, so just uh, quickly uh, getting on to that, I, I'd like to cover a few, a uh, couple more points, which is also important to uh, for us modelers to start thinking about the governance in India. Is the governance, uh, you know, uh, there are some um, bits that are la lacking, which a lot of us would agree on uh, that there are no best practices available. So uh, we'd like to have that uh, brought into place with the brain power that we have in India in terms of transport modeling, global design, and also with all of the data boom that is happening. So uh, the, the important question that we would be trying to answer is, can we really use the conventional modeling parameters in the Indian context? So I guess that is uh, um, driving the change here. In order to, uh, rather than looking into developing standard conventional or uh, traditional models, I think in India, uh, we have have been all saying that India is being a data poor nation, but there is a possibility for India to become a data rich nation with the UPI transactions, which we have seen tremendously that has increased uh, over the last year uh, since COVID. And also the fast tag uh, solution to toll plazas, GPS usage, and a lot of cheap AI technology that is evolving in the in the industry. So these have uh, sort of given us uh, or opened up the doors to sort of uh, solve real time solutions uh, rather than doing some predictive solutions to transport um, planning questions. So I guess uh, this is more about how we effectively collaborate all the industries that is the mi uh, uh, sorry the ai ml startups that are evolving in india and the global design expertise such as ourselves um, such as um, some of us like me who work in the indian mncs but do have a lot of global design expertise and our opportunity to collaborate and marry these two um, different worlds together and bring by a change <clears throat> in india so uh, with that, I'd like to um, thank everyone who have uh, who were able to uh, be in the session and listen to this. Um, so, Lawrence, thank you, thank, thank you, Shadevi. That's really really good. I know there's going to be a lot of questions about uh, the need for data and the different types of data and different types of modelling have all covered in your your presentation there. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to uh, Prashant uh, Udayakuma from Steer, who's going to talk about the challenges and the insights in transport modelling. Prashant, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Lawrence, for the uh, introduction. 
um, and and thanks Revati and uh, Sri Devi for uh, talking about those things. I think uh, my my uh, contribution today sort of links a bit to the previous session I N two, where uh, there, there was a discussion about uh, the challenges around modeling in the Indian context, and I'm going to link that with. Uh, the emphasis that we have in this session on uh, new insights through new thinking and new models. Uh, so uh, to introduce myself first, uh, I am Prashant Udaya Kumar, and uh, I work as a consultant with uh, STEER at uh, our India office in Delhi. Um, um, I, I have done my uh, transport planning education in the UK at Leeds, uh, but I but my work experience uh, primarily relates to the Indian context. I have worked on a variety of uh, uh, sectors in the transport industry, including toll roads, uh, transport planning, developments, e-mobility, and intelligent mobility. And I've been able to uh, sort of gather a lot of my learnings and thoughts about data and modeling in these sectors. And, and today, particularly, I'm going to focus on three sectors that I worked on, as you see on the screen, toll roads, transport planning, and developments, but more but particularly uh, from my experience at STEER. So I'll start with a bit of a background on each sector, uh, speak to you on the challenges very briefly, and then move to uh, the insights and the thinking that have emerged. And, and I'd like to sort of challenge this a bit to not necessarily see the challenges as something negative, but as an opportunity for new thinking to emerge in terms of data and modeling. Uh, uh, so starting with toll roads. Um, uh, so toll roads in India, um, especially in the last 20, 25 years with the National Highway Development um, Program and, and more recently uh, Bharat Mala, uh, which is uh, uh, which is a very huge program of uh, road upgrades and relaxation of choke points on the Indian highway network. Also very closely linked with the port port uh, oriented industrial development. Thinking of the Sagarmala program, uh, so there's been a lot of monetization of toll roads in the country. Expressway development. Uh, you would have also heard of the recent fast tag. Uh, uh, making mandatory of the fast tag implementation, which is the electronic uh, tolling pay, toll payment method. Uh, so this is a very in exciting industry, not only for the government in terms of um, promoting economic development, but also for toll operators, uh, consultancies, um, uh, and uh, investors. So international investors like pension funds have been really Quite interested in the sector. So let's look at a few challenges in this sector. So um, currently, um, we do not have um, uh, any regional or national models of the highway network in India. And, and I just go backwards uh, on the points that you see on the screen. Um, you will see that there is a lack of traffic counts and origin destination uh, su survey data uh, on sufficient number of points on the network. So when you don't have that on sufficient number of points, you're not able to make a four stage uh, travel demand model. And, and that primarily um, results from uh, the data not being openly available, uh, data from two key streams that you see at the, at the top. So uh, one is uh, biannual or biannual, uh, annual IHMCL counts, traffic counts that the National Highway Authority of India does at several locations on the road network. These are not openly available um, in my understanding. And the second stream is more transaction based and, and they are driven by uh, uh, road assets across the country where transactions buying and selling happens or, or there are annual um, um, uh, fair market evaluation exercises that toll operators and investors carry out. Uh, so th there is a challenge there in terms of data not being openly available and also not sufficiently available across the country. So you don't have a travel demand model. How do you deal with this? 
So my insights here based on my experience are that even for investment grade forecasts, uh, Excel models do give you an alternate uh, option. So we know in, in the UK, in the US, people think about Cube, Wisdom, Saturn a lot, but um, given lack of sufficient data, we can use Excel-based models um, uh, using uh, trying to understand the four stage um, travel growth, uh, collapse it down into an economic trick, long-term background traffic growth, which sort of is driven by the macroeconomic uh, growth of the country. And secondly, uh, network developments can be individually uh, analyzed to sort of see, see the potential diversion impacts. That's like your stage four and your four stage model using, um, again, you, you could use logic models for that as well. So that's some thinking uh, that we've, we've come up with. And, and access control, expressways, fast tag implementation, and, and also the new proposed GIS based gantry like tolling across the country uh, will definitely help improve um, uh, the quality and quantity of uh, data points in the country. Uh, I'll, I'll move on to transport planning now. Um, so uh, uh, just a bit of a background there. Um, uh, transport planning essentially uh, uh, relates to, um, in terms of modeling here, would relate to data evidenced decision making by policy makers uh, bureaucrats and transport planners, essentially. Uh, but but we, we see a lack of that in India, and that primarily um, uh, draws, uh, th that primarily results from um, a lack of uh, data, even in the urban context. We know for uh, the purposes of mobility plans, master plans, and traffic and transportation studies that are regular survey, surveys conducted. But very often um, uh, in our own experience of advising public sector clients, we've seen that the client does not know where the data from these surveys have gone, uh, even for these uh, uh, plans, supposedly um, based on which uh, the long-term transportation strategies and investments in the city are based on. So there is a real lack there. And, you know, for example, in a particular city, we saw there were models being done in an academic setup that were different from the models that the public sector had used for the master plan. And also there, there is a, a lack of capacity in the public sector, not only technical, but also leadership to be able to define the functional specifications of the model, uh, what is the modeling need, and also to be able to use results from the model for decision making. And my insights there would be that definitely capacity building either through lateral recruitments uh, or, or other means, secondments are really necessary to build uh, the both technical and leadership skills. And there is uh, on, on the lines of what you have in the UK coming up, like for example, TFL's new integrated motion model, which sort of uh, integrates the, the rail plan model, the highway model, which is Loham, and, and other models together, uh, or, or, or transport for north in the in the UK's new modeling analytical framework, which calls for a, a, a consistent use of data sets, tools, and models for uh, appraisal. Because where public funds are at stake for appraisal, there is a need for a, a fair evaluation across competing uh, funding needs. And also, there is a need for a data collection framework, uh, which is synchronized with the models. Because you can't, if, if your horizon year is uh, 2034, you cannot be collecting data in 2032. Um, and, and, and such a, an approved modeling framework or suite can be used by panel consultancies and, and institutes uh, for their modeling needs, or uh, more particularly for any sort of funding request. And thirdly, with regards to uh, developments, uh, developments meaning uh, the real estate sector, be it uh, uh, development of office spaces or residential complexes or other commercial developments. Um, uh, we know that it's common practice in the Middle East and in the in in the Western world that um, uh, traffic impact assessments need to be conducted, and uh, 
the 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 approved model uh, the trip and model uh, needs to be updated with what would be the impact due to the development on the road network but in india such thinking is very very nascent and i, I can think of uh, one one maybe just one city which has mandated this uh, but uh, in my understanding uh, a, a lot of Indian cities still lag, lag behind, and even if they do ask developers to do traffic impact assessments, we, we've heard from their own mouths that they don't really look at uh, these uh, traffic impact assessment reports. So um, there, there is a lack of enforcement there, and, and data here again is collected in two streams in my understanding. One is for the master plan and the long-term uh, strategy development for the city, which is the regular process every five years or 10 years or so. The other is, uh, the other more interesting one is where real estate players, especially more recently have taken an interest in asking traffic consultants to uh, do uh, studies uh, that help them estimate what is the traffic demand that their development is gonna generate. Uh, they also want uh, to uh, want help in improving the mobility within the development and also try and reduce the impact of traffic on the main highway. And, and here I'd just like to point out uh, a few things, uh, a few insights based on my understanding uh, of, uh, both from our experience in India and my understanding of what happens in the UK. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you would have heard about Tempro, which which is like an interface for the national trip and model in the UK. And this sort of standardizes the trip rates that uh, developers, uh, policy makers, um, and, and land use planners can, can use to understand the interrelationships between land use and transport planning. So that calls for a more integrated approach to planning, urban planning in that sense. And we see a lot of- up now, please. Yeah, closing up. But, uh, and, and developers are uh, interested in, in improving the experience within developments. So there is a, a clear need in the sector, and I and I believe that um, uh, traffic impact assessments really need to be mandated for both new and ground fleet developments. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, that's that's about uh, uh, that's about it on my contribution of both challenges and insights for transport modeling in the Indian context. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant. There's some great uh, insights there and some great experiences. So next, I'd like to hand over to Shubanka uh, from Sunovatech, who's going to be talking about digital twins and some really exciting technologies for the presentations of models. Yeah. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, and uh, just wait a minute. Yeah. Can you see it? Okay, I hope everyone can see it. Thank you again, Lawrence and uh, uh, Professor Tom, Juliana, Daniel, and Lando team for creating such a wonderful platform for us to speak and share our ideas. Uh, um, I heard every one of the panelists, uh, thank you so much for your views and uh, <clears throat> describing different challenges uh, in the Indian context, uh, different data collection problems which uh, we are facing. and. Uh, heterogeneous traffic problems as as mentioned earlier so as the i'm just laying on the laying down the context of this particular presentation so that you can see this technology uh, immersive reality digital twins technology as a possible solution to different types of problem uh, we face in indian situations so being on new thinking new model and new insights we are to focus on new thinking and new insights uh, in this particular presentation first. So <clears throat> moving on further, uh, I myself, uh, Shubhankar Devai, I work as a transport and mobility planner at Sunovatech uh, Group. Sunovatech Group is an India-based multinational company, which uh, we are not new in this business. We are 18 plus years of experience, uh, 150 plus clients, 600 plus projects, and six, uh, uh, six plus global location offices. So Sonovatech is a company that specializes in creating digital twin environment, software development, uh, transport modeling and simulation, framework developments, uh, virtual reality solutions, and mob mobile applications. So earlier, Sonal presented in the earlier, one of the earlier sessions, uh, the virtual reality uh, control room uh, for 
controlling the mobility uh, in the city. Uh, this particular technology of the digital twin, which we'll be looking at this particular presentation, uh, can interact with different stakeholders, not only the users of the mobility, but uh, also the traffic managers and traffic planners to give them a particular insight. So mobility is changing. There is no new thing or uh, this statement cannot be validated more uh, from the right from the invention of a wheel to uh, to current technological interventions. Uh, everything has changed mobility uh, to what it is now. But uh, we are facing currently the challenges with uh, with uh, never seen before travel behavior changes in COVID. So this is a new dimension which has come in and uh, uh, which is changing mobility to its uh, very peak now, uh, where we need to follow social distancing norms, uh, whether infrastructure is uh, available or capable of uh, changing, uh, suiting the changes in the travel behavior. Uh, how can we judge that? So let's move on to the technology first. Uh, so what is Digital Twin? It's a 3D georeference virtual replica of real world environment. Not, not only real world environment, but it can be a virtual replica of anything. Anything uh, like a machine, uh, like a telephone, like uh, like operating machines, which is simulating certain operations. So it can be a virtual replica of anything. So in this particular case, uh, I am most of my talk will be focused on a built environment real uh, digital twin. So it is also called as hybrid twin, and uh, uh, we can create validated model based on digital twins uh, of products, productions, and operations. Uh, it's, it is it is a link between the real world data and a virtual representation of the built environment. Uh, also, it can be seen as a one stop solution to manage uh, and optimize the operations throughout the city. So moving on further, uh, this is one of the examples of exteriors, how, uh, how, how a digital twin exterior can look. And this is one of the snapshots of our work. And uh, it's an exterior of uh, Al Wahada bus stand on Abu Dhabi, in, Abu, in Abu Dhabi. And uh, this is uh, measured to the precision of the blocks on the road. So all the people you are seeing here moving is uh, based on the certain algorithms uh, coming out of the simulation models. All the vehicles you are seeing on the road are moving with a certain uh, simulation environment coming out. Uh, trajectories are coming out from a certain simulation environment, and all the exteriors are uh, just exteriors are uh, the work of some tech uh, company. So this is the, similarly we can also have a digital twin environment of the interiors where you can just uh, get into this environment, experience all all the things, all the built environment, all the music, uh, sounds across the environment, and it, it's an experience in itself. So <clears throat> moving on further, what are the benefits of digital twin environment? Uh, it aggregate, analyze, and visualize complex information. Yeah, as mentioned by the panelists, uh, there are challenges in India. Uh, also, I see different types of challenges, like uh, there are silos of information uh, sitting with the different departments in the cities. And these department zones don't communicate with each other in a way, uh, way, or if they communicate, there is a lengthy processes of doing so. So there is no interaction of information, and uh, this particular communication gap causes a lot of uh, time and energy wastage. So in a digital twin environment where you can put on and embed in information on the uh, assets on the uh, built environment, uh, this can be a one-stop solution for cross uh, cross information communication also it helps to take more informed decisions in the sense uh, you can have a, a complete sense of all the assets you have and uh, resources allocation and infrastructure planning can be optimized so if you have the real time data coming in from certain sources uh, it can be uh, put in as a real time so real time digital twin environment and you can monetize uh, you can monitor the whole city sitting in your uh, home, so it's it's like this. Also, it, it it's effectively analyze, manage, and monitor data. Uh, it, it improves citizens' lives. Uh, this is a generic statement coming in, but uh, it improves citizens' lives if it is implemented properly by uh, by the operators of the authorities uh, in terms of mobility. If we are speaking, so this is these are the few benefits or the gen uh, few benefits which can. Uh, 
which define digital environment uh, in, in mobility contexts. So here I present to you a case study for creation of 3D, 3D digital twin for connected autonomous vehicles. And uh, it, we have partners like Haribamoira, University of Warwick, and different software suits uh, throughout this particular case study. So it, it is actually uh, a process which I'm taking you through uh, to bring uh, different side of the picture uh, to you so for, for mobility planners to understand how things can look like on the other side. So uh, first and the foremost, if we want to create a di di digital twin of an environment, it, it has to be uh, survey data has to be collected. So most of the time, uh, LiDAR surveys and the drone based photogrammetry surveys are taken in. And uh, these are then uh, processed uh, and uh, we uh, we are my software suit uh, which creates dense mesh uh, for processing it further so it looks something like this uh, this is the subway uh, these are the building environment which looks like this is a dense mesh mess available uh, in the vr mesh uh, then we create a 3d model using 3d studio max and uh, the vr mesh and uh, it is a very detailed model where all the buildings, existing buildings and built environment is uh, created uh, in 3D Studio Max. Uh, I have a few pictures for that. Uh, here it is the road and the, all the signs and boards you see up here are uh, marked up to the precision and uh, uh, all the buildings, uh, lane markings, number of lanes, everything. Then this particular 3D model uh, with the help of complex uh, simulation uh, environment uh, is processed again and overlaid with the uh, point cloud data uh, from uh, from uh, LiDAR service. And uh, finally, uh, with the help of uh, uh, certain processes which are in uh, Sonovatex uh, intellectual properties, these are converted into uh, environment which is optimized and georeferenced. Uh, the last steps comes in the validation of the created 3D model, which is uh, done by taking the pictures of the on-site pictures and uh, 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 all the pictures are matched. For this particular project uh, with the client as University of Warwick, uh, we took around 6,000 pictures for an area of uh, one kilometer square. So it was, everything is matched up with the uh, 3D model where you can see this particular board is up here. Uh, you can see the all the girders uh, matching up here. The point of reference in this particular picture should be a little bit further away. Uh, you can match the pillars, uh, markings on the roads, and everything. So in this man manner, we compare the on on-site photography with the 3D model, and uh, finally validate the 3D model. Now this 3D model created can be uh, used uh, in different uh, scenario. Uh, developing softwares like IPG Car Maker, where you can test the test the vehicles in this particular created environment and create different scenarios for them. Uh, similarly, you can do it in road runner, runner suit, uh, create detailed roadway design and scenarios uh, using the 3D model developed. Uh, it can also be done in the scanner model, where it is uh, uh, the same 3D model can be taken up and more detailed scenario planning can be done. So. At last, you can also take this uh, uh, 3D Max model to Unreal Engine, where you can land in the environment you created and uh, you can test anything. So in this particular picture, you can see a dummy vehicle, uh, which is testing this particular created built environment. Now this dummy vehicle is itself a digital twin of the vehicle. Now, so all the functions in the vehicle uh, is exactly simulated here for this particular digital twin of the vehicle now it is testing the environment by moving on the uh, moving the environment and uh, it can uh, calibrate itself and the work can be done by testing the uh, interaction of both the environment so this is a technology which i am bringing in front of you where you can have your thoughts on this as an open discussion how this technology can be more helpful in terms of Indian contacts. Uh, we are doing this work for uh, 18 plus years now, and uh, we are India-based multinational company, which can, which are open to collaboration for uh, R&D and different projects with uh, institutes uh, and private players. So apart from this, we are working uh, a lot of uh, other stuff in VR. 
and uh, we so we are health and education is one thing uh, we are counterterrorism training uh, where we create a built environment and uh, you cannot train uh, uh, security forces in a real time situation by creating the scenarios uh, which can cost you the life lives of people or stampedes so in that particular scenario we create the built environment for people to train in and uh, infotainment and uh, terrorism is uh, another upcoming uh, sector where this application of the virtual reality and, and digital and training is coming so forth. So this is up from my side. Thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, having me here. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really, really insightful. Uh, so our final speaker is Abdul Pinjari uh, from the Institute of Science in Bangalore. So I'll just hand over uh, to Abdul now. Hello. Uh, so I, I hope you all can see my screen. Yes, we can, Abdul. OK, great. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be a part of this, uh, this group, um, uh, discussing new thinking, new models, and new insights. Um, I am Abdul Pinjari, a faculty at the Indian Institute of Science in uh, the Center for Infrastructure, Sustainable Transportation, Urban Planning, which we call in short form system. Um, so what I'm going to touch upon today is uh, a few aspects that that I, I think sort of uh, blend with this theme from the standpoint of uh, emerging data um, and emerging modeling uh, aspects, so to say. So what's in the screen, for example, is inside the uh, circle is all the modes of travel and all the substantive issues in, in that we, we all think about today, uh, whether it's in India or elsewhere. What's outside the circle is you know various uh, methods that one can bring to bear uh, to address these questions that we are facing today. Uh, demand forecasting, network analysis, traffic flow modeling, infrastructure related to pavements and stuff. And uh, another important one is sensing me measurement. Uh, this is where there's a lot of uh, you know, new, you know, emerging uh, techniques, emerging technologies that have come in place um, that has created uh, you know, uh, uh, even new mobility systems, not just a way of sensing and measurement, but new mobility systems altogether. All of this toward basically, you know, these broader goals, you know, sustainability, uh, better policies, better planning, um, and SDGs, all of that, right? But if you uh, look at it in all of these threads, uh, whether inside the circle or outside, data becomes a very important aspect. And uh, the question is, how do we use emerging data and, and the emerging methods that come with it to bring to bear to address these the questions relevant to uh, the, the uh, various modes and various questions inside the circle and questions relevant to the larger picture questions such as you know sustainable development goals sustainable policies planning better planning better cities smart cities and all that now in that context i'll give a few examples uh, of uh, a few projects that attempt to use emerging data and some issues that we're facing and i'll try to sort of wrap up uh, from you know with a summary of uh, uh, what uh, lies ahead and what lies forward in terms of challenges and opportunities. Um, here is a, a slide that tries to describe what we're trying to do. Um, yeah, you know, sort of merging data from various sources. Uh, BMPC is the bus transit corporation in, in Bangalore. They run 6,000 buses uh, or more. Uh, BMRCL is a metro corporation. Um, and, you know, these agencies have uh, um, a bus corporation, for example, have Almost all of their buses equipped with GPS devices. Um, uh, the data goes to the state, state data center, and from there we have an MOU with, with them to get data um, uh, offline and in real time. And then uh, we are partnering with these last mile providers uh, who provide uh, you know these uh, um, as and when needed mobility on demand, mobility as a service. Uh, the idea is that we combine these different data sources from transit agencies and last mile providers. Uh, to provide door-to-door um, -door connectivity uh, for travelers that includes uh, a combination of these last mile provider modes and, and, and the transit modes. The transit provides the, the, the long haul and these last mile provider modes provide the first and last mile connectivity, so to say. The whole idea is to, you know, to try and bring together the best of these two different modes. Uh, transit provides mass transit uh, capability um, uh, at a lower cost. Um, uh, and uh, these uh, ride-share, uh, ride-hailing services provide as and when needed mobility on demand 
um, um, uh, that also door to door connectivity service. Can we bring the two, two together? In concept, yes. Uh, in practice, um, data again becomes a challenge. That's where we're trying to bring it, uh, bring these two data sources together, both offline and in real time. Um, not just data, you know, the, the, the modeling techniques and, 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 and the algorithms that can be used to address questions in real time, answer questions in real time on where, uh, you know, this ride hailing vehicle has to go um, and what information do we need to provide to the traveler. Uh, um, in terms of you know uh, where to hop, uh, take the right hailing service and where to hop the bus and and how long will it take and so on and so forth. All these are you know decisions that need to be made in real time, which needs algorithms that run quite fast um, and, and and make the best decision possible with the available data. So to say, um, um, so the challenges here include um, you know data gaps, data connectivity issues, and uh, and also uh, the need for fast uh, algorithms um, uh, that are reasonably accurate for real-time decision making. Uh, another question that we're trying to address is also improving reliability of bus transit systems. Bus transit systems suffer from lack of reliability. That is not a fault of the transit systems. It's a fault of um, the, the transport network and congestion and all other unforeseen events that happen in the network, including you know surges and demand and all of that which leads to you know, unreliability in transit systems because these buses bunch together. Bus bunching happens on various routes, especially on routes that are crowded. That leads to uh, increased availability of buses where there, when and where there is no need, and at the same time, decreased availability of buses when and where there is a need. That, that, reduce, that sort of uh, throws the schedule out of the window and, um, and makes it difficult for travelers to expect um, or guess when the bus is going to arrive. That also we are trying to address by providing information in real time. More than that, we are also trying to see if we can implement control strategies using this data that's coming in real time um, to, re to reduce bus bunching to the extent possible, so to say. So all of this, again, um, um, you know, needs not only the data that we, we are getting from buses and other places, it also needs data from a variety of other uh, uh, sources. We need the networks, we need the traveler's location, we need the... Uh, um, uh, information on um, where the bus is going. In other words, we also need to predict where the bus is going. Um, uh, however, we don't have information on what the schedule, uh, the, the destination for the bus is. Um, uh, that's because it many times um, the bus schedules can change on a day-to-day -day basis um, because of day-to-day uh, -day variability in availability of crew, and other reasons that the transit agency has to make these changes for. And that is, some of those are difficult to uh, predict uh, unless we have, we get information on a daily basis, sometimes on a real time basis from the transit agency, so to say. So considering all those uncertainties, how do we provide the best information possible to the traveler? And how do we provide the best information possible to the transit agency operator uh, in terms of reducing bus function? These are some of the questions that we're trying to grapple with. Again, uh, much of it comes down to um, uh, uh, lack of uh, reliable uh, data, which increases uncertainty in, in what we can model and predict. And hence, in the face of uncertainty, how do we uh, make those decisions and, and, and make it better for both travelers and transit agencies? Um, here's a, an example of uh, how unreliable travel times can be from the standpoint of variability of travel time on a certain corridor that's about 18 kilometers in, in length. Um, the lowest travel time is, uh, you know, a few minutes less than 30 minutes. The highest travel time is uh, close to two hours. The amount of variability, as you can see, is substantial. We are trying to see if we can, you know, reduce the bus bunching issues and provide more information to travelers, and uh, as well as, you know, you know, spread the travelers along less crowded routes to to avoid uh, denied boardings and, and and through all of these various uh, ways trying to see if we can reduce uh, you know this variability and you know tighten this this spread a bit more so to say um, again um, not only data is an issue but also using that in real time and making decisions in real time in the face of uncertainty that's an issue um, uh, to, uh, as much as we we uh, we tend to you know think data is a problem but using all that and in, in making decisions in, in real time is not so easy even if we had all the data at our at our uh, disposal so to say um and again uh, not only the data that's on you know that's coming from these vehicles used from the standpoint of their um, real-time spatial temporal location 
but also uh, the data that uh, we have um, from over multiple years or at least multiple months on where and when travelers are traveling to and from where and when they are traveling, so to say. That helps us you know, estimate demand and estimate crowding to the extent possible. Crowding is a bit of a tough nut. Um, uh, demand uh, at an aggregate level, we can estimate crowding uh, uh, you know, at an individual route and individual trip level um, is something we're trying to grapple with. Again, because partly because of uncertainty in the data that we get, also uh, because of uh, the difficulty in uh, you know, sort of converting the data into accurate crowding estimates. Uh, when I say accurate, you know, the level of accuracy we, we, we need to talk about is uh, to estimate how many seats are available in the bus, uh, to estimate how much space is available in the bus um, uh, from the standpoint of, you know, for example, ensuring social distancing um, uh, within the bus. And, and based on that, you know, tell the traveler or provide information to the traveler on whether to wait for the bus or, you know, um, take a bus that's already there that's, that might be slightly longer in route and might take longer in time for the person, but at least the person might be, you know, uh, safer uh, in a less crowded um, environment in the bus. Also, um, you know, might uh, reach there in 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 with, with greater reliability in the arrival time, so to say. Um, that brings me to this whole question of demand. Um, you know, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, what can we do uh, using uh, emerging data to to quantify, measure, mod, you know, um, analyze, model, and if possible, modify the travel demand. Now, before I do that, you know, let me just give an idea of what travel demand is, which um, I'm sure uh, all of us in the room know. But just, just to, you know, as a you know, quick primer uh, um, uh, for the sake of discussion in the subsequent slides, um, we can think of travel demand as a manifestation. Just one of, minute left. One minute. Just a it? minute. All right, um, um, I'll skip this. Uh, we want to see how we can use this data to estimate demand, which we are trying to use, um, you know, for transit systems, only transit data to estimate transit demand. But at the same time, we are trying to also, um, you know, use data from various sources uh, 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 to develop a research program to model, predict, and preempt traffic congestion. This whole, uh, you know, a model and predict has been there, but preempting traffic congestion is something that we'd like to do. That needs again uh, quite a lot of uh, more real-time data, so to say. I'll skip this, these, all these slides, and um, you know, uh, end with this slide that that says that you know, emerging data seems to offer promise to leapfrog for better measurement and analy analysis and decision making in transport systems. However, um, the one point that I'd like to convey that emerging data augments uh, the the, the so-called traditional data. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily replace it yet for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, for example, questions of representativeness remain, and that that Im that implies we perhaps will benefit from fusing with traditional data as opposed to thinking of replacing emerging data with traditional data, at least for now and for the foreseeable future. Um, and also, you know, can we enable an ecosystem or a data marketplace that allows easy access to data from various locations and various uh, data uh, providers and who has the data, while also enabling you know, uh, privacy protection of the data and from, who, from where the data comes. Transparency in terms of uh, the pros and cons of the data and data ownership, meaning you know, whoever wants to provide data to whatever extent we provide only that access, as opposed to making the data available for all and so on and so forth. Uh, doing all of this might uh, help create an ecosystem and a, and a data marketplace and economics around the data that also might lead to a lot of positive benefits. Um, again, uh, the question I also have is which emerging data allow us to measure all that we need to measure? Perhaps no single source. Again, uh, an important source to fuse that also uh, makes a case for this ecosystem that brings together various data sources and cuts across the silo so silos of the data sources and, and, and makes it possible to add value um, uh, from the standpoint of, you know, when we have multiple data sources uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, with that, what I'll do is, you know, thank you all for the opportunity. Um, happy to discuss at a later thank point. You. Thank you. Abdul. And I'd like to invite all of these speakers back uh, for the roundtable discussion. Uh, so some amazing talks there. Um, I think it's probably worth starting with data. So uh, thank you for everyone who's asked questions in the chat. So we had a question from uh, Sonal Ahuja who asks for all the users, um, how can we in India fill the data gaps uh, as data collection efforts for model making are always too little too late? So maybe we can start maybe there with uh, uh, Ravathi. 
Yeah, so in terms of caps in India. Yeah, so one of the method that I had to do was uh, it's it's not like we need to just collect data because what happens is if you just start collect what happens right now is you start collecting data where it is available, and what happens with that approach is that there is a lot of bias in the data. So to to do a, a transport modeling which is quite unbiased, I think what uh, what, uh, what Shubankar was presenting is quite an interesting area because one of the method, one of the problem that I mentioned was uh, I'll go back to the question about doing a stated preference survey and the and the general public not being aware of what is that responding to we are not able to correctly uh, as a transport model and as a government we are not able to show the urban consumer what the future looks like what are they actually giving their preference for that is a very big uh, drawback that I have seen with an Indian system, as opposed to a Western country where you have public consultations, uh, the public is made aware of what is going to come. Uh, that level of engagement of the public uh, with the government is lacking. And what uh, how Sonal company can help uh, or what, what the virtual reality can do is actually show them the benefit of why they should share data with the government. So uh, that is one uh, one area where, which I can think of. And because they are into many other areas, maybe uh, they can even, uh, they can set up uh, an institute uh, and a policy with the government that they would be the uh, uh, data aggregators. They can do this, uh, they can have a, uh, they can have a, uh, I'm not much uh, into, I, I do not know how a data aggregator would work. I do not know what the commercial implications would be, but they can have an agreement with the government, right? And they can use, uh, you can, they can use this uh, data, what they are, uh, which they are collecting and they can, uh, uh, they can do it periodically uh, for the government if they have the, if they have the resources and means to do it. And they can, uh, they can give it to the R&D, which is the academics and to the consultants. And thereby, because the, all the research and uh, development activities happen to, through a grant. So this grant, uh, which the central government is going to uh, give to the research team can be bifurcated into two, like a data and the actual research. And the data can be given to an aggregate, the data grant can be given to an uh, data aggregator company. And the research can be undertaken in any of the uh, IITs or IISC so that they can concentrate more on the uh, technicalities of how to implement. So that would be my answer to that. I'm sorry, Lawrence, I think you're on mute. It's I think you're still on mute. Everybody, Lawrence is just logging back. Can you hear me again? Is that working? That's better. Ah, oh, sorry about that. I reset my microphone because I could, it was all going. It was all going um, uh, intermittent. So, if I can bring in Sri here. So, the question really is around uh, mobile network data and how widely that's used in India. You're also on mute, Sri. <laughs> Maybe somebody else wants to jump in on that, on, on the use of mobile network data in India. Shubanka, is that something that you've seen? Uh, I just want to point out uh, we are a country with 760 million smartphone users and smartphone has so many sensors in it. So we are not making good use of our smartphone sensors. That is what the basic point it is. And uh, there, there are challenges to use it because uh, as Revati pointed out, uh, there is no proper aggregator of the data who can look after the data privacy and uh, different issues which comes with the data of 
taking data from the phone. So yes, it's a big problem in itself, and uh, it can be solved out like the way Ravati suggested, and uh, uh, proper aggregators and grant system has to come in place. Uh, these are my views on data collection. I think more or less this is the problem. Hello. Another question from Peter Davidson in the chat was all around the quality of information from the census India. Is I mean, is there good information around population and employment? Uh, Prashant, maybe I can bring you in here to, to give some of your experiences. Um, no, I have not used the census data actually, so I might pass the question to someone. Uh, I, uh, I think I do have a point to mention about uh, census information. So it is quite it is quite good respect to the demographics like population employment but one drawback is that it uh, the census question asks only one question uh, what is your mode of travel so a single question uh, it doesn't uh, that that uh, definitely does not uh, describe a travel it's a multimodal travel so i think the point is that uh, the person who is collecting data should be aware of the modalities that are involved so uh, the census India just asks, what is the main mode? So I, I assume the respondents would be giving the main mode of travel. Uh, so there are nine options, but there is no consideration of the, the, the main sources of data, what are the best sources of data that you see? So you're asking what are the best sources of data that are used in India? Okay. Um, well, the census is a useful source uh, for aggregate level information um, of the demographic distributions uh, and all that. Uh, the micro data, however, um, uh, it's not easy to get um, um, a small percentage of the sample, let's say 1% micro data that's typically available in the US, UK, and many other countries. That's not easy to get. Um, otherwise, travel surveys are done here also. Uh, uh, having said that, it's, it's a challenge uh, to get um, good quality travel survey data. Uh, not because people don't uh, try to get quality, but the, the travel behavior is a bit more complex, so to say. Um, uh, 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 a more uh, reliable source of data is uh, this, this probe data. Data uh, on probes, on buses, on vehicles. Um, that's, you know, there is not much of a, you know, uh, substantive uh, information uh, except spatial temporal locations right? that's quite reliable um, as good as uh, it is in any other place in, in the world so to say yeah that's what i think okay, the, the point clouds that you showed i mean how cost effective are they and do you think that they've got application and what are the applications you think they could have on you know capturing network information and the like uh, within india uh, cost effective in the sense uh, if we want to do something in reality and create infrastructure and then figure out the solution to it uh, it would cost much more so in terms of that it's a very minuscule cost uh, for creating or collecting data point based data uh, which is which is a built environment data but uh, if we talk about this uh, other part of data which comes in the mobility uh, and the problems uh, which I see as a pers person, personal traffic modeler, and uh, my experience uh, with the uh, modeling is uh, in India, nobody follows lean discipline first thing. So if, if you have an idea, people follow here. So nobody follows lean discipline. At the signals, you will be seeing a clog, uh, people will be clogging each other. And this is very difficult to model and extract data from. So if you have a CCTV footage, you cannot use algorithms to figure out uh, what's the count or something like that, which is a very high dense and densely populated environment in itself. So what the solution to which I see is the only solution to which I see, which is cost effective in terms of uh, time consumption. If we evaluate the cost of time and everything, it is we have to utilize a mobile phone location based data effectively so that we can figure out a way where we can design better service we can figure out a way how to use gyroscope and other magnetic sensors and mobile phone to pull out transport mobility data and make it of our use this is the only way out i see so we've got we've got five minutes left yes. in the discussion uh, so i'm just going to ask uh, around the anglo-american models and sort of obviously they have a long history but to what extent do the panelists and speakers feel that they're not fit for purpose for use in, in India. So maybe I'll start with you, Revathi, because that's part of your, your, your talk. 
so uh, the argument here is that a lot of research has gone into the empirical models and all the simulation models which are currently there in the Western world. But what has to be parameters represent? So just as an example, uh, there is a whole framework of uh, mechanism called variable demand modeling and the inherent essential Elasticity values to guide how the response should be, and the so responses in the elasticity values are so low that a drastic response is not an outcome of this model. So, if you were to, uh, if you were to take, wherein every two years you have uh, skyscrapers uh, propping out, it would not be a suitable model. So, the question is about picking the right model. So, uh, it, I would say, in fact, I would prefer something which is being built up in a Dubai to being adopted to India because uh, over the course of uh, 10, 15, the landscape there quite similar to what you're witnessing in Mumbai. To be given uh, to what is it that you're adopting and whether are you aware of all the parameters within that? I, I'm pretty sure. Maybe, maybe I have to bring you here in for sure to talk about some of the modeling you're doing in Excel. I mean, are there any opportunities to do that in other sorts of software or, or some free and open source software? Uh, we, we've done, we've used this um, wherever uh, there is a good service of road networks, for example, in, in the states of Uttar Pradesh and Gujarat and India, where there's a, where there's a greater concentration of um a road network especially that which is getting privatized or or expressways there you have a greater concentration of data points locations across the network where you have traffic counts and od survey data so uh, we have done used wisdom there but otherwise generally um we, we tend to use excel where there is a lack of uh, a built um a road network model was that so in the interest of, yeah that's that's really 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 useful so i think just in the interest of time i'm going to close uh, the session because we will get kicked out at two o'clock uh, but i would encourage everyone to visit the exhibition booths uh sponsor the ticket prices loans some really interesting presentations and materials across the booths but also talk to some of these challenges particularly of interest for anyone thinking about new modeling techniques uh, but it remains for me to thank all of the speakers uh ravafi uh, abdul um, Prashamp, uh, we've, we've lost Sri, unfortunately, and Suvanka. So thank you everyone uh, for, for contributing to this session and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you thank soon. You. Thank, you. Thank, thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, thank you all.